Well, hey, welcome to Life Point Online. My name is Rusty. I'm one of the pastors here. So glad you're joining us virtually today. Looks like this might be one of our uh, new normals, but but I hope you're doing well. I hope you're practicing safe distancing. Uh, maybe for all you more introverted types, this probably feels like Christmas. And so, you know what? Blessing of the Lord. That's that's awesome. But I do want you to know that 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 I've been praying for you. That as a staff, we absolutely care about what you're going through. And so if you have specific prayer needs, email us, Facebook us, whatever it may be, comment, uh, let us know so we can be praying for you uh, even better. Also, if you wouldn't mind, if you just click on that connection card on your phone or on your computer or whatever uh, and fill one of those out, we just want to make sure that we have all of your correct contact uh, information. That way, as we're sending information out, you won't be missing out on everything that, that we have planned. But but here's the thing. Today, we are kicking, or we're actually continuing a series we started last week called When All Hell Breaks, Breaks Loose which what we're really doing is we're diving deeper into a book of the Bible called First Peter, where what we're doing is we're looking at this and, and how do we respond, right? How do we respond when our world seems like it's turning upside down? When our whole world seems like it's going crazy, how are we to respond? In fact, just this last week, uh, my wife and I, we went to Costco. We braved Costco. I don't know if any of you have done that as well, uh, but if you did, it was a little weird. It was like it was almost like Black Friday at first, right? Because, you know, you get in there and there's this huge long line and and you're kind of like pushing carts and and trying to get into your spot. No cutting, you know. But then once we got in the building, everything switched. It was eerie. It was like because nobody was really there. There's like 50 people for this humongous warehouse. And so we would go aisle after aisle without seeing anybody in Costco. But then when we finally did see someone... Nobody ever made eye contact. We, we didn't. It was almost as if, you know what? Hey, you keep your COVID over there. I'm going to keep my COVID over here. And none of our COVIDs are ever going to touch, you know? Uh, but then, no joke, literally, every single time, though, anyone ever coughed loud enough in the place to hear it, everybody's head just turned, and we all kind of just judged them immediately. You know, we just kind of wanted to vote them off the island at that point. Uh, super Christ-like, for sure. But, but see, honestly... That's actually exactly why we're doing this series. Because as followers of, of Jesus, I think we're called to live differently, especially during times like this. And see, let me just give you a little bit more context into the book of 1 Peter, because like we mentioned last week, what's happening in 1 Peter is that all of these people are being oppressed. You have all these followers of Jesus that are being oppressed because of their, of their faith. Look again at 1 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Where again, they were, they were being scattered because of their faith. And see, here's the truth. When we feel like we're, like we're under attack, right? When we feel like the walls are closing in, when we feel, feel like, like fear is, is increasing, you know what we get to do? We get to choose how we respond. We absolutely have a choice on how we're to respond to that. And see, my prayer for, for each and every single one of us for the last couple of weeks has been uh, that we would respond appropriately, that we would respond well because of the spirit of God that lives inside of us. And so in just a second, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to a little bit more uh, of that and, and how maybe we can respond. But for right now, let me, let me just look at, at three ways that that might be negative responses to times like this. And unfortunately, I think I see some of these things a lot more often uh, than maybe we'd all, we'd all like to. And so do me a favor, click on that outline on your phone or computer or wherever you're at. But if you want to take notes, just write this down. The first one is compromise. This is how sometimes there's a negative response. And this is where we, where we kind of water down our faith. In fact, I'll explain it this way in, where it's like, you know, there's, there's no devout Jew, there's no devout Buddhist or Hinduist or, or Taoist or Muslim or whatever that would say that their religion or their God is exactly the same as others, right? In fact, it's, it's, it would be insulting to a Jew to say that Allah is the same as Jehovah, right? Or it'd be insulting for a Hindu uh, or to, to say that, uh, to say to a Hindu that, that, you know, Brahma is the same, is the same as, as Buddha, and yet sometimes what we do is we water down our faith to be more universal, 
right? Oh, God, God takes, God takes many forms, you know, or you believe what you believe, I believe what I believe, and then we'll all be, we'll all be just fine. And see, here's the thing. Tolerance is good, right? The apostle Paul admonishes that tolerance is good, that we're called to be tolerant. Relativism is bad. The challenge though, is that people often feel about their faith rather than think about their faith. In fact, there's a famous French philosopher named Blaise Pascal who wrote this. He said, most people arrive at their beliefs, not on the basis of truth, but on what they find attractive. And see, our temptation is to sometimes change the definition of our faith really based on our, on our feelings. Number one is compromised. Number two is privatized. Right, that we can have a privatized face. And this is really where, where we stay quiet. And typically there's actually two reasons that, that most of us might, might do this. Number one is really crazy Christians. Any of y'all know some of them? If you don't, it might be you just letting you know. But, but they're really, and there's a difference, right? So I'm not really talking about mental illness. I'm talking about people who are nuts, right? And, there, and again, there, there is a difference where these people can, can often make normal conversations about faith awkward. I mean, I don't know if you've ever, ever heard this before, but it's kind of like if somebody comes up to you and says, Hey, is that, is that chair saved? And, and, and you're like, uh, no, but you can be, and you can, you can be saved. You just believe in Jesus, right? Just, just super awkward. You know, in fact, a long time ago, I went to, uh, I went to lunch, uh, with a buddy of mine, uh, and we were there and, and he was on fire for Christ. He was, uh, which was awesome, but he just didn't really know how to, how to nuance it, right? He didn't know how to, how to help people in where they were at. And so he just, he just spoke spiritually all the time, you know? And so, and so we were sitting there uh, at lunch and it was almost time to, to get the bill and whatnot. And he takes out a track and a track, if you don't know, is just a way to, to help people come to to know Jesus and it's not bad. It's just the way that he kind of went about it. Cause you know, the server came back up and, and said, Hey, you know what? Here's, here's your bill. And, and, and my buddy said, Hey, you know what? Uh, I, I suppose you probably want a tip. Well, here's a tip. Uh, the tip is I want to tell you how to, how to get into heaven and, and avoid hell. Right. And it was just kind of this, this super cringy moment, you know, where, where I was like, Oh, right. And, and it, it, it just didn't come off all that all that properly. And it almost, honestly, it made me feel like I just wanted to crawl under the table and I'm a pastor, you know, where I just believe that if I would have crawled under the table, I, I probably would have seen Jesus there as, as well. But, but see, again, I think, I think sometimes we privatize our faith, maybe because of, of things that we've seen or crazy Christians or, or whatever, but two uh, is also because of personal cost. Where, where maybe it's, it's ridicule at home or at work or whatever, or maybe you, you're afraid to no longer get invited to, you know, neighborhood parties or, or whatever it may be. And so because we want to fit in, sometimes we've decided to leave Jesus at home. We're ultimately, I think, I think ultimately we, we justify it by thinking, hey, at least we're not like the third category, which is antagonistic, right? At least we're not like antagonistic people, who, people who, who attack others uh, that don't share our faith. In fact, this last week I heard a little story about a, a, a little girl and she was, in, she was in school and she was talking to her teacher about whales and humans. And her teacher said, hey, you know what? Don't worry about it. Uh, whales can't actually swallow humans because even though they're large animals, they have very small, small throats. And, and so the little girl responded and said, well, what about, what about Jonah? Like Jonah was swallowed by, by a whale. And the teacher was irritated and said, no, honey, you can't, you can't be swallowed. Whales are large, but their throats, their throats are small. And so the little girl said, you know what? Well, then when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. And, and our teacher smugly looked at her and said, you know what? What if Jonah's in hell? And, the and, and so the little girl responded and said, you know what? Well, then if he is, then you can ask him. <laughs> that's good. I don't care if that's virtual or not. That, that's good. And see, it's true that, that we live in a culture, especially online, that provides a platform for antagonistic behavior. But again, as followers of Christ, we are called to grace. And so if those are ways that we, that we shouldn't respond, then what are some ways that, that we can respond when our faith is under attack? There's four things that I've listed there. And again, we're trying to truncate all these messages down about 20 minutes just so, just so you won't go click on Netflix and start watching Lock and Key or whatever it is that you're, that you're binge watching right now. But here's the first one. The first one is don't be shocked. 1 Peter 4.12 says this, says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, 
as though something strange were happening to you. And then he offers some context. He says this in 1 Peter 2. He says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And see, most of the time, our faith, our faith won't cost us. But sometimes it will, and that's okay. You know, when I first started really following, following Jesus, uh, it definitely cost me. It cost me. It cost me friends. It cost me financially. It cost me invitations, right? I mean, people literally stopped inviting me to things. And it wasn't because I turned weird. It's just they, they just literally did. But see, during, during that season, there were also some, some realities that, that comforted me uh, and encouraged me as well. And, and, and ironically, a lot of them actually came from First Peter. Or maybe, maybe you'd find some, some encouragement in these. They're not in your notes, but you can write them down if you'd like. But one reality that comes from 1 Peter is the fact that you were chosen. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2, or 1 Peter uh, 9, through, 9 through 10, that you're chosen. Uh, there's no, you, you have a destiny, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 25. You have resources, 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. You have a purpose, 1 Peter 2, 4 through, 4 through 8. And see, it's the reason why around here at LifePoint, we harp so much on wanting people to know that our desire is for you to know God, to find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Because we just believe that that's what God desires for us. And that it really shouldn't be shocking when we go through some of the difficulties that we do in our life. And see, it's from that point of, that place of strength and security that we can really endeavor to, number two, live an authentic, positive example. That we can learn to live an authentic and yet positive example. At my last church, uh, we had some neighbors that, that bordered the church. They, they were actually at the very bottom of, of the hill. And, and, and it, was at, it was at one point in time, there was, a, there was a building campaign that was going on. And these particular neighbors became so antagonistic that they actually ended up um, costing the church $1 million in, in legal fees. A million dollars. And so I remember there was one time that that it was snowing and I, had, uh, I was driving down the hill and, and they were at the bottom of the hill and, and, I'm, and I'm sitting there, I'm trying to wave to them and say, hey, you know what, I'm coming, I'm coming. You might want to get it. Hey, you know what, I'm, I'm driving down the hill. I don't know if I can stop, you know, all of that. And so I'm, as I'm doing this, at, at one moment in my mind, I, st- I decided, you know, maybe I should stop doing it. Maybe this is my chance. <laughs> uh, kidding, sort of. But what I actually did was after all of that, what we decided to do uh, with, this, with this couple was we decided to befriend them is what we really did. And so, and so uh, every, she, she would walk up and down the hills all the time. And so we'd, we'd always, I'd always make an extended effort to, to say hi or I'd strike up a conversation. In fact, I would actually take her tea almost every single time she was walking through our parking lot, even though when she was walking through the parking lot, she was marking things down to send to me and say, Rusty, here's my problems. Not, not even kidding. Well, after a while of doing this, actually after a couple of years of doing this, uh, those notes started to stop. And, and eventually, the very next time we did a building campaign there, uh, they not only weren't antagonistic, they actually became our biggest fans. They were the biggest fans for the church. In fact, when her husband passed away, she, we got a nice note for her saying this. He said, he always felt like you were looking out for us. And see, the truth is that we can absolutely be a powerful example in how we respond to difficulty. In, in, in really how we're responding to our current situation, our current difficulty as well. First Peter 2, 11 through 12 says this, says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And then we actually read this a few verses later. It says, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. And see, I don't know if you know this, but before Christianity really came onto the scene, some of the things right now that are, that are really hot buttons out there, uh, they, they weren't really a thing. Like forgiveness wasn't really a part of the global culture. 
Equality wasn't a goal, right? Children's and women's rights or children's and women's values weren't important. Racial reconciliation wasn't even a thought on people's minds. And yet Peter still admonished us to do exactly that. And see, for us, for us, maybe that means, you know, because this is an election year, like if we engage or or even how we engage in political discourse, it matters, how we respond to people's needs matters. How we, how we choose to connect with people over the next couple of months, even if it's not for you, even if it's just for them, right, matters. And see, through all of this, here's our challenge. If we call ourselves followers of Christ, here's our challenge. Our challenge is to create a sense of curiosity through compassion. Through compassion. Where the truth is, where, the truth is this: Do I believe all that the, all that the pagans do? Right, the, uh, First Peter, how Peter really describes it: the pagans do. No, do I believe that Jesus Christ died for them on the cross? Yes, I do. Which actually leads me to number three: We're positively, positively within the current reality. And see, honestly, this might be the most difficult and, in some ways, more perplexing part of the book, especially when you're in a situation that's difficult or it's unfair, or, or even hostile. In fact, look at what it says in Scripture, in 1 Peter 2.13. It says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. It says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. And see, let me be very, very clear here. Kids, this means your parents, right? Employees, this means your boss. Citizens, this means the government, Right? your Democratic governor, and your Republican president. In fact, Peter goes on four verses later. Here's what he says. He says, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. Do me a favor, if you can, I don't even know if you can, highlight honor the emperor, highlight honor the emperor. Because what's crazy is that he's saying this, all of this, about a man who was oppressing them. Like this is literally Star Wars going on right here. It was the emperor who was oppressing and killing the Christ ones. And yet he's saying you need to honor him for Jesus' sake. And then in the very next verse, 1 Peter 2.18, it says, accept the authority of your masters with all respect. And so here's what I know. I know some of you, this is hard. It's hard because you don't, you don't agree. And yet the question is going to be this. Are you going to let God be God, right? Are we going to let God be God or are we going to be God? See, first Peter actually says that, that, that here's what it says. It says that we are slaves to God. We're slaves to God. Where Peter says to, that we're to walk with the Lord even when we don't, even when we don't see. Why? Because every single one of us that call ourselves followers of Christ were purchased at a price. We were purchased at a price. In fact, look at this example that Peter gives in 1 Peter 2, 22 and 23. It says, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And so you know what I'm thankful for? I'm thankful that God didn't fight on my terms. I'm super thankful for that. That when I disobeyed or, or, or when I ignored him, you know what he said? He said, I love you this much. That's what he said. That when the Bible, the Bible says that we were all, while we were all still sinners, Christ died for us. And see, obedience to God should be a good enough reason to do what he asks. It absolutely should be. But in his grace, he actually says that by doing this, that you will increase joy in your life. First Peter 3, 9 says, don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do. And he will bless you for it. He will bless you for it. Here's the last one. Number four is to seize the opportunity to introduce transformational truth. That we've got to seize the opportunity to introduce transformational truth. First Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone, but do this with gentleness and respect. Folks, if you want God to bless your life, you need to care about what he cares about. You know what he cares about? He cares about people. Or again, my, my challenge to everyone listening to this is to, is to find a way, find a way to bless others during this time. Primarily, primarily because here's the reality. The greatest way for us to stop thinking about our own issues and our own problems is to start helping others. Is to get outside of ourselves and really start to serve others. 
you know, Easter is coming up right around the corner. And as a staff, we're really trying to think about creative ways of how we're going to be uh, introducing the gospel to people and all of that, where, where I have to be honest, you know, a couple of weeks ago, my biggest point of lament, my largest point of lament was the fact that we were going to lose out on having, having the ability to have people come to Christ on Easter. But you know what? I was wrong. I was totally wrong because I absolutely believe that God can still perform miracles regardless of if, if there's a building that we can meet in or not. That he can perform miracles through us where he wants us to, to be a part of his mission as well. And so I'm gonna ask you, would you creatively think of ways? Would you think of a way to invite someone that might not ever come to church at a location but might check something out online? Well, we're gonna try to, try to help you along with that, absolutely. But at the same time, that when, when, when all hell breaks loose, when there's issues going on in the world, I can promise you this, people are far more open to trying to find hope in their life. Where, where they're, gonna, they're gonna be far more open to maybe saying, okay, maybe, maybe I'll try out this whole, this whole Jesus, Jesus thing. And see, I know that this is a tough time. I know it. My family, are, we're right in the middle of it with you. But I wanna encourage you. During this time, do what the Apostle Paul says as well. Think about things that are praiseworthy. Think about things that are excellent. Think about things that, that God has put into your life. Gratitude that, that, that by doing these things, by responding differently, that we might actually be able to win some. Because again, how we respond matters. In just a moment, uh, I'm gonna sit with Pastor Mike and, and, and we're gonna go live and we're gonna be answering your questions. And if you have any questions of things that's going on in, in, in your world or your sphere or, or, the world or whatever, uh, Facebook us, comment, uh, write it on, you know, email, whatever it is, uh, we're gonna try to get to those. We're gonna take 10 minutes and we're gonna try to get to as many of those questions as absolutely, as absolutely possible. But here's the thing. Here's what, here's what I wanna leave you with. God is with you. He loves you, and as a church, we're here for you as well. I want to pray for us. Father, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, that, that you are always there. I thank you, God, that, that you're there in the midst of struggles, that you're in the midst of challenging challenges, God, that you're right there for us. Father, I thank you for your word that it encourages and it fills us, that it gives us hope. But Father God, I also pray for I, I pray for our nation, Lord. I pray for our leaders. I pray, God, for, for, for our state leaders, for our, for our government, God, for our president, for, for all of those who are trying to, trying to eradicate and, 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 and come up with solutions uh, to this pandemic. Father, I pray that you would give them wisdom. I pray, Lord, that you would give them clarity. I pray, God, that you would give them uh, Holy Spirit creativity on how to battle this. Father, I thank you that we have each other. I thank you, Lord, for a, a church that we can lean on, people that we can lean on. May we be uh, reaching out even further during this time. That God, even though the doors of the church is closed, that doesn't mean the church is closed. God, that we can still be your hands and feet wherever you call us to. Open up those opportunities. Lord, we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen.